and welcome everybody to the daily space weather video this one's dedicated to bob carson feel better first thing we're doing is we're looking at the sun the main source of space weather we'll look at cosmic rays later in the video as well interesting data on those coming up most of the activity right now in the sun is in the southern hemisphere we've got three sunspot groups down there 2898 2899 and 2900 here's a colorized magnetogram and the likelihood of solar flares has gone up a little bit here as a result of the growth of additional umbrae especially sunspot 2898 but all of these groups in the southern hemisphere here are beta class sunspot groups meaning they have both polarity umbrae north and south pole this plage up here in the northern hemisphere is not a sunspot and here's that same couple of wavelengths this is 335 and 94 angstroms together great view of those active sunspot regions in the southern hemisphere <coughs> excuse me the radio flux I think it's at 90 now it came down a little bit looks like it's at 92 that's the solon.info graph this black line is the 10.7 centimeter radio flux the most proportional data set we have to sunspot number 92 is the current 10.7 centimeter radio flux and we do have a forecast here by NOAA for some geomagnetic unrest forecasted tonight and into early tomorrow so we can expect to see some aurora from that we'll cover it in tomorrow's daily space weather video let's talk about seismicity for a quick moment here 2010 was a highly seismically active year you can see there was a drought between October and December here uh, but otherwise pretty seismically active year in 2010 there's 2011 and I'm just showing you this to show you earthquake drought such as this one between May and August of 2012 we're currently in an earthquake drought the year 2015 began with an earthquake drought as you can see there there's 2017 had a very long drought between February and July 2018 had a long one between March, March and August. And there's the current state of affairs. That's 2021. Here is the last 90 days. That's from VolcanoDiscovery.com. And let's go up the list here at USGS, citing any interesting quakes. So earthquake droughts, folks, those end in large earthquakes. We're talking about seven magnitude earthquake droughts. There's a certain periodicity to them and the statistical analysis thereof gives us some insight into the likelihood of future earthquakes right so we did see a couple of 5.3s here at tonga those were only three minutes apart there so some significant shaking going on there north of new zealand in the deep quake capital of the world those were both surface quakes however the reconis ridge also saw a 4.7 that's in the middle of the atlantic ocean there south of greenland peru saw a deep quake at a 5.1 magnitude nearly 110 kilometers estimated depth for that papua new guinea saw a 5.3 so the earthquake lull continues also a 5.4 at papua new guinea a deep quake at chile a deep quake at argentina and the philippines saw a 5.2 magnitude quake there was a 4.1 at Trinidad, California. That one looks like it's out in the ocean. Let's take a quick look at that one. And there's a location of that. Not far from, well, off the coast of Eureka, I'll say. Pretty decent distance out there in the ocean. Looks like a pretty, only a pretty desolate area would have been affected by that. And let's look at volcanoes next here at Volcano Discovery on their Volcanoes Today page. I want to know what's erupting. La Palma's exploding 10,000 foot ash plume produced over the Canary Islands. Subanose Jima. 7,000 foot ash plume from Subanose Jima. And now Bagana comes back to the list here. Exploding is Bagana, located on Bougainville Island in Papua New Guinea. It's producing a 7,000 foot plume of volcanic ash. 
please do not attempt to do the Fosbury flop over the Caldera Semeru, located on the Indonesian Isle of East Java, is exploding as well. 14,000 foot ash plume from Semeru. Yasur now making an appearance once again on the list. As it explodes, that's Tana Island, Vanuatu. 6,000 foot ash plume produced by Yasur's explosive activity. Fuego in Guatemala exploding. Flight level 150, that's a 15,000 foot ash plume from Fuego. Nevado del Ruiz producing a 20,000 foot ash plume over Colombia as it explodes. Sangay exploding as well. 20,000 foot ash plume from Sangay. The other Ecuadorian volcano that's on the list here is Revenador. Also exploding, 15,000 foot ash plume from Revenador. Saab and Kaya were unable to detect. Don't assume it's not erupting. Nevados de Chilean exploding. 14,000 foot ash plume from Nevados de Chilean. That's located in the central region of Chile. And last but not least, the Soufliere Hills, located at Montserrat in the West Indies. Making the list here. And it looks like some changes there in the sulfur dioxide emissions. The large size of the lava dome and unstable hot lava material is prone to collapse into hot rock falls, which in turn develop into very dangerous pyroclastic flows and may travel in Plymouth Town direction. Pyroclastic flows are deadly turbulent hot avalanches of lava rock fragments of all sizes embedded in a mixture of turbulent gas and ash racing down the slopes. Yet another reason to not pull vault the caldera. And do provide public service messages for your friends and foes by picking up some merch at our shop. You can find a link to that at the homepage at smashamash.com. Also, links below the video. Don't forget to enter the promo code CYBER5 to save 20 to 60%. And today's featured product is Do Not Pull Vault the Caldera. We've put them in listed, we've listed them in order here of best selling. So, again, tell your friends and foes not to pull vault the caldera. Thanks to everybody who's picked up merch. They make great gifts. Again, you can find links at smashamash.com on the homepage or below this video. And thanks to everybody supporting the channel via picking up merch and sending it to your friends and foes. <laughs> Welcome to the Neo Renaissance also, folks. Congratulations on realizing we exist. You can find all kinds of links at the homepage, such as links to the Smash Team, which is what we've replaced Patreon with. And if you haven't checked it out, we're going to be putting up all kinds of public posts throughout the month of December and the rest of November. The rest of the year will feature public posts. Thanks to our paid subscribers, there are three different paid levels there, silver, gold, and gold paid up annual. Check out the website for additional details, smashamash.com. Smashamash.com slash smash team. Now magnetic data. Here is the goes 16 and 17s. Measurements. These geosynchronous near equatorial satellites. Showing fairly smooth graphs here. Nothing to write home about there. And Earth is in a North Pole current sheet. You can see it here in green, part of the Gong 2 data set here. The top view ecliptic plane field plot. Earth is going to remain in a North Pole current sheet for the foreseeable future. Here is the line of sight view with essentially the same data. Solar magnetogram there as well. Next line of sight coronal hole plot. And you can see a large trans-equatorial North Pole oriented system there shown in green. We're expecting a coronal hole wind stream from that red system there in the south. That's a South Pole oriented coronal hole system which will be providing some geomagnetic unrest perhaps later in the night tonight. So later tonight, early tomorrow, we may see some Aurora Borealis and Australis. We'll keep you posted in tomorrow's video. We do it daily, so you don't have to. So here's this, here's the sort of the southernmost portion of this North Pole-oriented trans-equatorial coronal hole. And it's this whole area here is North Pole-oriented coronal hole. So we'll be keeping an eye on that and guessing whether or not it'll be putting an eye on, on us. Next, our flare monitor. Likelihood of solar flares has gone up a bit since yesterday. Uh, coronal mass ejection watch has been shut down, so no CME watch in effect at the moment. 
And there you can see Sunspot 2898, 2899, and 2900. These are all beta class Sunspot groups. They're all capable of producing flares. And uh, 2898 has grown a little bit since yesterday. There are some additional South Pole Umbrae there that have popped up in the last 24 hours, increasing the likelihood of solar flares. When we talk about solar flares, we're talking about photons. Yeah, photons. These are X-ray frequency photons here. No major flares in the past uh, three days. Again, likelihood of that is much higher as activity in the southern hemisphere continues to grow. No spikes in the proton flux, no coronal mass ejections headed our way, no major flares, no relativistic particles. At the moment, let's go to the real-time solar wind, which we just saw a little spike in here. Saw a little uptick here in the solar wind speed, as well as a change in the plasma temperature, making it likely that that's a real signal. Also, the phi angle and BTBZ shifted at the same time. Current conditions are a very diffuse coronal, uh, a very diffuse solar wind here at only two protons per cubic centimeter, and a nominal speed there about 350 kilometers per second. Pretty unremarkable. Next, the KP index is at one, having been at zero for six hours before that. KP index is a measurement of global geomagnetism. For you new viewers, congratulations on realizing the channel exists. Next, our Geospace Magnetosphere movie. This is four hours of space weather modeling framework. You're looking at the Earth's magnetic moment from space out to about 12 Earth radii. We see a little downtick there in the magnetohydrodynamic pressure just in the past couple of hours. Again, we've got a very diffuse coronal hole, a very diffuse solar wind speed, rather. And uh, the we've got a very diffuse coronal hole. Uh, okay, let's try this again. We've got a very diffuse solar wind, and the speed of it is just nominal. So no major changes to Earth's B field either here. This four hours of data is geospace delta B. Changes to Earth's B field. Some perturbations kicking up there at the end of that video. Next, the diagram of the solar system. We're going to show you a forecast. There's where things will be in a week. It looks like a new moon will be on December 4th, my favorite phase. It's usually accompanied with better sleep and less stuff going on at night. It's dark, and there's just less things going on at nighttime. It's not because of some magical effects of the moon or anything. Folks, it's because people sleep worse because their sleeping chamber isn't dark enough <laughs> at full moon. Next, a star chart. If you're interested in what's going on above your head, check out in-the-sky.org. You can see the moon is up here near the apex of its path across the ecliptic, which is this yellow line. The blue line there is the galactic plane. And the sun will be crossing the galactic plane as it moves from Gemini to Taurus today. I don't know if you care or if that means anything to you. As astronomy begins to look more and more like astrology in many ways. So just to reiterate here, the coronal mass ejection watch has been shut down. Here's the view from Stereo A and the Lasco C3. And keep in mind, folks, the magnetic environment can suddenly change, and so can our watch or warning. That's yet another reason to be a member of the Smash Team. Smashamash.com slash Smash Team. Here comes a cosmology segment. This one's integrated into the Daily Space Weather video, as many have. Yet another reason to tune into our content daily. Cosmology segments also have a playlist at YouTube.com slash Smashamash slash Playlists. So let's do it. There's nothing random today at all. We're going to talk about cosmic rays, which have significantly upticked here in the past about 21 days. So these are one day, 30 day, one day and 30 day charts from Apatite and Barentsburg. You can see this precipitous uptick here since the 4th of November. And while it's relatively flat here over the past 30 days, you can see we're at higher levels than we were at 30 days ago. Almost the exact same graph there at Barentsburg, indicating it's probably not erroneous data. Next, we'll go farther south to Athens. There's the Athens neutron monitor. Pretty flat here over the past 30 days. Maybe a minor uptick. Even farther south is Mexico City's observatory for cosmic ray flux. 
And you can see Mexico City now in a higher regime than it was a month ago. And we'll also check Olu Finland and DOMC and DOMB Antarctica. So there's Olu. And you can see the historic graph here where cosmic ray flux was higher in about 2010 than it is now. But in any case, over the past 30 days at Olu, it's a slight downtick there, nearly flat over the past 30 days at Olu, Finland. DOMB Antarctica is showing some wild swings here in the past few days. <clears throat> and a minor uptick over the past 30. DOMC Antarctica's got some missing data over the past couple of days there. And a pretty big spike there at DOMC also, right about 30 days ago, which does make for a slight uptick there. Well, it's, it's flat. I'll say that's flat over the past 30 days. Let's look at something else not random. It's Galaxy M101, the Messier Catalog Galaxy M101. Here's that galaxy in X-ray. And you can see the nucleus, as well as a bright spot in one of its spiral arms there. And when we look at it in ultraviolet, it's going to show the features of a large spiral galaxy. It's known as the Pinwheel Galaxy. And we'll zoom out a little bit here to give you a better view of all of its both tightly and loosely wrapped series of Spiral arm. It's got quite a lot of spiral arms. Here it is in optical frequencies from the Pan Stars. One of the most detailed surveys you'll find. The Pan Stars, just a spectacular image there in bands Z and G. Last but not least, we'll show you it in infrared as well. There is the thermal radiation, which is much less affected by dust and gas. In M101, and we're showing it to you because of the astronomy picture of the day. It's quite a spectacular one. So we're just going to do a slow crawl before we zoom out to hold you in suspense during this cosmology segment. Again, make sure you check our playlists. There are over 230 videos in our cosmology segments playlist. We're going to kind of zoom in on the galactic nucleus here of M101, the pinwheel galaxy. And we'll zoom out to show you the whole view. If you want to look at that yourself, it's at apod.nasa.gov, a very high resolution image of the galaxy. M101, the 101st entry in the Messier catalog. Also, let's talk about the Parker Solar Probe. On the 21st of November, it set another record, both with speed, proximity to the sun, and you're going to continue to see the Parker Sol Solar Probe set records each time it reaches its closest point to the closest star. And there's an article here on SciTech Daily about it. It's the fastest object ever built by mankind, as far as we know. Traveling at 364,660 miles per hour. Again, this article's on SciTech Daily. I'm just letting it scroll here so you can feel free to pause the video and read the article if you like. SciTechDaily.com, again, is a source of that. Thanks for tuning into our Cosmology segment. Again, don't forget to check our playlists, folks. We've got all kinds of videos besides our daily space weather. <clears throat> Let's look at satellite charging. No charging hazards at the moment. And the electron flux is at rather high levels here, but not quite at warning levels. We did get into warning levels briefly yesterday, as you can see by this red dotted line. That is 1,000 particles per negative square centimeter. <clears throat> that also coincides with 1,000 pulse flux units in the electron alerts that we send to the Smash Team at smashamash.com slash smash team. These can cause communication breakdowns and so on. They can cause satellites to experience damage or to shut themselves off to prevent said damage. Here's the forecast, and we can expect a little bit lower levels here when the coronal hole wind stream arrives. No arguments there with the NOAA forecast. Next, we're going to show you the total electron content, which is essentially this region right here between a GPS satellite located around 12,500 miles of altitude and your GPS handset. High levels of electron flux can cause GPS errors. That's a reason to have location accuracy turned on to use Wi-Fi hotspots to help to calculate your location. 
we do see some anomalies. We're going to let this play through a second time here. We see anomalies both around Antarctica and North America. Once again, it's been sort of uh, characteristic over the past about a month. And it all has to do with things like Earth's magnetic field, the angle of the Earth with respect to incoming solar radiation, and more. Next, we're going to show you the ionosphere. Here's the F layer located at 300 kilometers of altitude. This is the ionogram for the previous day. We'll also show you the anomaly gram after this plays through. It took us months to figure out what tabs to cover as we want to see the physics tied together with the rest of the science. So here is the anomaly gram. This is anomaly in megahertz from the 30-day median. Quite a lot of low-frequency anomalies here. Central Atlantic, the South Atlantic anomaly over Africa, over Central Asia, some low-frequency anomalies shown in red there. Anyway, there's the latest image. That's 1030 Universal Time Ionogram. There's 1030 Universal Time Anomaly Gram. Again, low-frequency anomalies there over Central and Southeastern Asia, also Northern Africa, and the Central Pacific Ocean. Did you know that we do meteorology segments as well? They typically premiere before the Daily Space Weather video. Make sure you check that out. Again, you can find links to all kinds of other stuff below the video as well. Let's do bonus features. And the first bonus feature here is the view from the posts view from smashamash.com slash smash team. We have picked up another article here. You'll have to go read it yourself. Smashamash.com slash smash team. Next, the ground-based solar observatory at Udaipur, India. Some pretty up-to-date imagery there. Let me shrink it down a little bit. That data only 6 minutes and 15 seconds old when we recorded the video. Here's your latest intensity gram and solar magnetogram to see what's going on in the southern hemisphere. And it's quite a bit of activity here. There's a beta class sunspot group over there. 2899. There's 2900. That's grown since I did the show prep. 2898 has grown since yesterday. Certainly, here are the fields. So the southern hemisphere, where all of the action is happening, likelihood of solar flares has gone up. Here's some more composite imagery. This is 335 plus 94 angstroms. And here's ionized helium by itself. Thanks for tuning in, viewers. Don't forget to press share, like, subscribe, tell your friends and foes about us, and may that solar wind be at your back.